Take a point P. P finds itself in a flat space called a two-dimensional Euclidean space. Say a point Q also pops up on the surface. And we want to find the distance between the two. But the line we draw has to be the shortest possible distance. Of course, the intuitive thing is the good old straight line. But how can we actually prove that this is true? Assume there exists a path other than the straight line PQ. This new path, Z, must at least consist of two segments that together form an angle at some point D along Z. Essentially, Z will look like a broken line from P to D to Q. According to the triangle inequality, the sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the length of the third side. Thus, PD plus DQ is greater than PQ. This inequality shows that taking a detour through D results in a longer path than going straight from P to Q. The argument can be generalized for any path Z that deviates from the straight line PQ. Any such path can be broken into segments that form a multi-sided chain, and applying the triangle inequality repeatedly will show that the straight line is always shorter than any broken or curved path. Describing the relationship between these two points using mathematical terminology might look simple, but it's not at all. First and foremost, we have to describe this flat space as a flat Euclidean space, R2 which is a coordinate plane. Now we can place the points P and Q on the coordinate plane. Each is described by a pair of coordinates, P by Px, Py, and Q by Qx, Qi. Now, how in the world will we be able to mathematically describe the line between them and its distance? Well, this is where vectors come in. In R2, any point can be represented as a vector from the origin to that point. For instance, the point P with coordinates Px, Py is represented by the vector P, while Qx, Qi becomes the vector Q. The origin serves as a common reference point for all the vectors in the space. By starting every vector at the origin, we establish a uniform way to describe locations in the space. Now, in order to find the line itself, we have to parametrize it which means that we need to describe every point along the line connecting P and Q using a single variable that continuously varies over a defined interval. The single variable is usually T, which we can describe as time. T exists in another one-dimensional Euclidean space. We parametrize it to the Euclidean space through this mapping. Parametrization provides a systematic way to navigate along the line. But just putting it this way means we have described the infinite line. We didn't put an interval to it. Thus, we have to define an interval from the starting point P to the ending point Q, which will be the equivalent of starting from 0 to 1. By defining T in the interval 0, 1, we ensure that when T equals 0, the position vector is P. And when t equals 1, the position vector is q. Now, let's see what's happening explicitly when we parameterize the line. For any value of t between 0 and 1, the formula r of t as a vector, which equals 1 minus t times the vector p plus t times the vector q, gives us a point on the line segment directly between the vector p and the vector q, effectively filling in the line segment. This basically means that if I replace t with 0, I will end up with the exact vector coordinates for the vector p, so px, py. Likewise, when I replace t with 1, I'll end up with the exact vector coordinates for the vector q, so qx, qy. Any number in between 0 and 1, which we plug in instead of t, will point to another vector coordinate, and will eventually create the line if we were to plug in the infinite numbers between 0 and 1. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. Now, how would we know the exact length of this line segment? We need one single number to give us this information, not a pair of coordinates, a number which will tell us the length of the line. This is done by assigning the line a scalar, given by another one-dimensional Euclidean space. Done through the mapping D or in full, d of the vector p, vector q, that goes from R2, Cartesian product with R2, to the real line. We have R2 times R2 because we have a total of two vectors, composed of two coordinates each. The scalar simply tells you how long the line is, without any reference to the direction of the line. 
The scalar property is what allows distances to be compared directly, added or used in various formulas without the concern for orientation in space. More explicitly, it is calculated by using the Euclidean distance formula, which is kind of an elaboration of the Pythagorean theorem. This formula simplifies the relationship into a single measurable quantity that doesn't involve any directionality, which is why it's termed a scalar. To visualize what we're doing, let's go back to our Cartesian plane. Draw a horizontal line from Px to Qx. This line segment represents the difference in the x-coordinates of the two points and measures as Px minus Qx in absolute value. Draw a vertical line from Py to Qy. This line segment represents the difference in the y-coordinates of the two points and measures as Qy minus Py, all of it in absolute value. And that is how we find the hypotenuse, or the distance between P and Q. Again, found through this equation. Now, the very same process can be repeated when we go to higher dimensions, not just on a single coordinate graph. Let's say we have a shape, like a loosely hanging sheet, formerly called a manifold, that exists by itself. It is not embedded into any dimension. It is the dimensions, which in our case will be n. Say we have our two points on the manifold, P and Q. We trace a line that connects the two points. You can literally trace any kind of line you like, as long as it connects the two points. In curved manifolds, the notion of a position vector, as used in Euclidean space, does not directly apply because there is no fixed origin. So, instead, we describe paths using curves. But here's an interesting catch. Vectors can't directly poke out of the points because there's nothing to poke out into. Remember, all of these points are on a manifold, not embedded in a space. There's no outside-looking-in perspective. It just exists by itself. So in order to draw a vector poking out of a point, say P, we have to use a tangent space. We access the tangent space by performing derivatives. We won't delve into the details here, but if you're curious about how exactly this is done, watch this video, which we linked in the description. You can come back to it at the end. So once we access the tangent space, we draw a vector on it that will be tangent to the curve or touch the curve at just one point, which in our example is p at t0. You remember the t? It works the same way as we described previously, map through gamma to our curve. There's a bit more detail to it because, as you may know, we don't perform calculus directly on the manifold. We actually map it to a Euclidean space in order to do so. But we won't delve into details here because it's not really necessary to grasp the idea. If you're curious to learn more though, we've also linked a video in the description which explains precisely what is happening and how, which you can turn to later. Anyway, the entire curve is made of these tangent vectors, each of which is found by performing derivatives for each point of our choosing. We do this infinite times up to gamma of 1. The numbers that result from the derivatives of each tangent vector specify the vector length, describing how much the curve changes at that point. Once we find all the individual vectors along the curve, we want to sum them up to find the length of the curve. This is done through the distance formula. This part stands for the length of gamma. And here on the right side, the derivative of gamma of t is the tangent vector to the curve at point gamma of t. And this term right here measures the length of this tangent vector at each point gamma of t. You see this g here? That's the Riemannian metric. You see, our tangent space TPM does not come with a measuring stick that gives us tangent vectors a concept of length and angle. A Riemannian metric puts a measuring stick on every tangent space, and it does so through the inner product. If you'd like to know more details on how that's done, leave us a comment below. Thus, we found a random curve between the points P and Q and its length. But what we actually want is the minimal length, the shortest curve between the two points. The distance D of PQ is the infimum of the lengths of all possible smooth curves gamma that connect P and Q. So instead of calculating all these possible paths by hand, we find the infimum of all such curves, 
In other words, we encode all the infinite possibilities and quote-unquote spit out the distance. Notice that I didn't say the shortest path, but the D, the distance. That's because D, by definition, is the shortest path possible. In more proper terminology, D is the minimal path. And it turns out that this specific curve, gamma, that has the minimum length between P and Q, is one of the geodesics of the manifold. Geodesics is the straightest path possible, or the minimal distance between two points. It is the closest thing to a straight line on a curved surface. Interestingly, the universe in general tends to favor the shortest path for anything, the minimal distance in a curved space. This field is known as geodesics, and if you want to know more about it, leave a comment below. Don't forget that we add a PDF link in the description below. There you'll find a much more detailed explanation of the concepts in the video. Remember, that's the only way to actually learn math, by doing it by yourself, understanding each step and trying to reproduce it independently. So we highly recommend you guys to download the PDF link in the description below. This was pretty abstract, and you may not know how to perform all the operations, like finding the inner product, for example. Well, that's why Brilliant is a great place to start. You'll love Brilliant's interactive courses. Brilliant takes complex mathematical concepts and break them down into bite-sized, understandable chunks that make learning both intuitive and effective. Their course on vector algebra dives deep into the mechanics of vectors in a visual and interactive way. Which perfectly complements what we've discussed today. You'll start from the abstract and intuitive concepts and progress to being a master at vectors. So, if you're eager to dive deeper into math, or to get a head start on mastering vectors, or any other math or science topic, head over to brilliant.org slash to start your free trial, or use this QR code. Plus, by using our link, you get an exclusive 20% off of your annual membership. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.